In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the practical aspects of collecting an NMR spectrum and talk about the characteristics of the key piece of data that comes out of this experiment, the NMR spectrum itself. Now, the first thing to mention here is that this energy difference between the parallel and anti-parallel spin states for the nucleus in the external magnetic field depends on the strength of that magnetic field. The stronger the magnetic field, the greater the energy difference. And so stronger magnets actually increase the sensitivity of NMR measurements. So this has been a big push in NMR instruments for decades now. We've been pushing to higher and higher magnetic fields to get greater and greater sensitivity, greater and greater resolution. For our purposes, though, the key conceptual point is just the stronger the applied magnetic field, that's B0 in our lingo so far, the larger is this energy gap between the alpha and beta spin states. This makes it easier to measure, more or less. The, the sensitivity of a nucleus to a change in B0 varies by nucleus, and lucky for us, the proton is among the most sensitive nuclei, so it's relatively easy to collect proton NMR spectra. Carbon-13 and other nuclei, we're not so lucky. We can still collect spectra for those elements, but they're not as clean looking, they're not as nice looking, and they're often not as structurally informative as proton NMR spectra. Now, typically to describe the magnetic field, while we could talk in terms of magnetic field units, which is typically in Teslas, we often talk about this in terms of the precession frequency of a standard nucleus. For example, the protons or hydrogens in tetramethyl silane is a very common standard compound used. This is a compound with very shielded protons because silicon is an electron donating element. It's sort of semi-metallic, right, metalloid. And so those hydrogens have relatively high electron density around them and tend to show up kind of on the far right of proton NMR spectra. Very few protons show up to the right of TMS on the x-axis. The precession frequency of TMS in a particular instrument is known as the operating frequency of the instrument. This is typically reported in units of hertz, frequently megahertz. And so kind of a standard value for this that you'll see probably in your, your teaching laboratory, for example, is something like 300 or 400 megahertz. If you need greater sensitivity, for example, if you're measuring the NMR spectrum of a protein, you often need a higher frequency instrument, something like a thousand megahertz is sort of state of the art for pro uh, protein NMR. And probably on YouTube, someone will correct me <laughs> and say that we've gone up to 1200 or 1500 or, or God knows what, but 1000 megahertz for proton, uh, protein NMR, the NMR of proteins is, is very common. Now, how do we actually measure an NMR spectrum? Well, we talked previously about the idea that one idea we might have is to just scan a set of frequencies of radio waves. So have some kind of RF generator that can vary in frequency and we just hit the sample via that horizontal direction with RF light of varying frequency and look at the response over time. This would correspond to kind of scanning the x-axis, right? and just measuring the response over time. The problem with this is it's very slow. Radio frequency light is actually quite low frequency, right? As, as light goes, these are very small energy differences, and so it takes a long time to measure these. So that's not super helpful. Another approach involves varying the magnetic field, actually going back to this slide and recognizing that as we vary the magnetic field, this gap is going to vary. And so if, if we can get some kind of variable magnetic source, we can change these energy gaps and again, look for a response as we vary the magnetic field. But that too is clunky. That was done back in the day and that's called continuous wave or CW NMR spectro uh, spectrometry. These days, essentially completely gone um, because of practical difficulties associated with continuous wave NMR. So it takes a long amount of time, and we need radio frequency power throughout the experiment, even though, as we saw in the simulation in the last video, we turn off that horizontal RF generator to observe the signal um, coming from the sample. In a Fourier transform, or FT NMR instrument, we take advantage of the wonderful math of the Fourier transform, which allows us to take essentially any wave shape for applied radio frequency light and sort of decompose it into its component frequencies and the intensity of each frequency. I liken this, to, to use a metaphor, to taking an audio waveform and converting that to a musical 
staff or, or musical notation. Musical notation, if you look, for example, if you draw a horizontal line, a vertical line rather, through musical notation, each vertical line is like a frequency spectrum. Everywhere you see a note is like a signal. And it's possible actually using the Fourier transform, nothing short of the Fourier transform, to convert an audio waveform like this into literal musical notation, a series of frequency spectra over time as the audio waveform advances through time. We do something very similar in an NMR experiment, where in a typical sample with a lot of different hydrogens, we're going to get a mess of different oscillating frequencies. And this mess is what's known as the free induction decay, or FID. It looks like a lot of squiggles that dampen and eventually go away as the external magnetic field returns all the nuclei to parallel with the magnetic field. But the Fourier transform can pick out these oscillations and show us the frequency spectrum, the intensity of those oscillations, and at what frequencies they occur. This slide just shows you the idea in graphical form. So here's a hypothetical FID for a compound containing two different types of hydrogens. And we can notice two different types of oscillations here, right? A low frequency oscillation that looks like this, and a high frequency oscillation that's kind of the sharp ups and downs within that low frequency oscillation. The mathematics of the Fourier transform can pick this out immediately and put those two frequencies on a frequency spectrum. So here we have something like the frequency in hertz along the x-axis and the intensity of response along the y-axis. This paragraphs on the right is just another example of this with two signals that are closer in frequency now. The high frequency component is not quite as sharp. Uh, those oscillations are a little bit slower and indeed in the frequency spectrum we see those peaks showing up a little bit closer together. So in an NMR spectrum, the units we use are different. This is something we'll return to uh, in a little bit. But more or less, this is the precession frequency, or the oscillating frequency, of the nuclei. And what the Fourier transform instrument allows us to do is just hit the sample with one pulse of radio frequency radiation, observe the decay in the form of the free induction decay, at which point we've turned off the radio frequency source, which is great from a power perspective, and then use the Fourier transform math to convert that decay into a frequency spectrum. Now, one thing that's a little tricky about NMR is that a lot of organic compounds contain hydrogen, including many of the solvents that we would use to dissolve a sample to prepare an NMR spectrum. We want the sample to be in solution so that all the molecules are more or less homogeneous and uniform, right? And so being in solution is good, but being in solution with a sample with a solvent that contains hydrogens is very, very bad, right? Because the vast majority of, of the signals will be due to the solvent hydrogens, not to the sample hydrogens. To get around this, we use solvents in proton NMR that are deuterated. Deuterated solvents that are free of hydrogen, except for a very, very, very small amount due to contamination. Deuterated solvents, while, while deuterium, which is the isotope of hydrogen with a mass number of two, while deuterium is an NMR active nucleus, it resonates at frequencies that are very different from just the proton. And so we can use deuterated solvents without issue in proton NMR experiments. And some of the more common ones are shown on this slide. Chloroform D has one deuterium where the H would be in chloroform. Methylene chloride D2, two deuteriums. Acetonitrile D3, deuteriums where the CH3 group would appear in acetonitrile itself. Benzene D6, and then deuterium oxide is an interesting one. This is water in which the two H's of water have been replaced with deuteriums, and for that reason you'll sometimes hear this referred to as heavy water, quote unquote. It's, it's water, but with uh, a couple of extra grams per mole in there due to the de deuteriums. So to prepare the NMR sample, we dissolve our compound of interest in one of these deuterated solvents, and then we put it in a thin tube like this. This is an NMR tube. It goes inside the instrument, and this tube spins. This, again, avoids any issues with anisotropy, uh, basically differences in the sample as the horizontal radio frequency waves pass through the sample. It spins in a direction perpendicular to um, that, that horizontal or uh, transverse field. All right, so what do we get out of the NMR experiment? Well, we get this frequency spectrum with 
the precession frequency on the x-axis. Again, remember, generally low frequencies are going to show up over here and high frequencies over here. And the height of a peak is related to the intensity of the response. And as we'll see, this is related to the number of protons with that precession frequency. The taller the peak, the more protons with that uh, precession frequency. So for each signal in an NMR spectrum, we care about three things. First of all, the location. Where along the x-axis does that signal appear? This is the resonance frequency or the precession frequency for those protons. The area, the area under the signal, tells us the number of protons with that resonance frequency. So this gives, might give us insight into, for example, whether we're looking at a CH group, a CH2, or a CH3 group, and this can also give us insight into any symmetry in the molecular structure. And third, we've got the shape. The shape of the signal refers to the number of subpeaks within each signal. You're, you'll notice, for example, that each NMR signal is not just one peak. It's a collection of, quite frequently, multiple peaks showing up sort of clustered together. The shapes of these clusters actually give us detailed structural information about nearby protons. And it's actually very, very pow powerful information for elucidating molecular structure.